writers, you're listening to the Kobo Writing Life Podcast, where we bring you insights and inspiration for growing your self-publishing business, coming to you from Kobo's headquarters in Toronto. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Kobo Writing Life Podcast. I'm Stephanie, and today we have a new co-host, Carmen, the manager of content operations, is joining us for our interview Hello. Carmen, this is her first time on a podcast, but also the first time on the Kobo Writing Life podcast. So, Carmen, can you tell our listeners a bit about you? Sure. It is my first time. I started at Kobo last summer, so now I'm just getting into the swing of KWL podcasts. Um, I started as an ebook designer, and now I'm on the other side managing ebooks. And Carmen's actually friends with our guests. So Carmen knows Brent Pilkey. And you, I think you designed covers for him, if I'm right? Yeah, I did his covers and his ebooks. All right. And he, if so, a little bit about him. He's a retired cop from 51 Division in Toronto, which is like a fairly rough area of Toronto. And he writes mysteries and murder thrillers, I guess you would say. And we talked to him about how his time as a cop influenced his writing and also how he was able to be a cop and write at the same time. Uh, So, yeah, please keep listening. So thank you so much, Brent, for coming on the Kobo Writing Life podcast. Thank you for having me. And so just before we begin, can you tell our listeners a bit about you? A bit about myself. 27 years as a uh, Toronto cop. Uh, Three years retired now, enjoying it immensely. Would strongly recommend retirement to anyone who can take it. Um, Can't wait. (laughs) (laughs) And on the Toronto Police, uh, started and did about a little more than half of my career in 51 Division, which is the Regent Park area, okay. um, a rather infamous part of town. Finished off in 32 Division up in North York, so a very, you know, complete opposite of where I started. Highlight of my career, three years I spent on the CIT, the Crisis Intervention Team, which um, pairs a police officer with a uh, mental health nurse from St. Mike's Hospital. And uh, we responded to calls dealing simply with the mentally ill. So mm-hmm. that was... Uh, an incredibly interesting, fulfilling part of my job, like I say, the highlight of my career, and I've actually woven part of that into the into the books. Like I said, three years retired, and uh, today is, okay, three days ago, they started construction on our house in Costa Rica, so... Oh, wow. You got big plans. <laughs> yes. Yeah. After I retired, two weeks after I retired, we moved to Costa Rica for a year. Lived up on a mountainside in about 10 feet away from the jungle, and uh, just fell in love with the country, so... Uh, we're, we're having a little, stress the word little, place built down there and um, hope to spend, you know, six months of the year down there. Will you be writing as well? Oh, writing in Costa Rica is, like, I mean, it's designed for it. Yeah. Um, you know, just find a nice shady spot to weather out the heat of the afternoon and just set up with a laptop. And uh, I found a, a really nice uh, Costa Rican cigar down there. So oh, one of look. those... <laughs> Good glass to go. of uh, Jack Daniels, and yeah, and no, I was I was set. I got a lot of writing done. I'm picturing there. like a hammock, and like you just sitting with a laptop. I've I've, I've never mastered the hammock and laptop bit, but <laughs> one day, <laughs> yeah, quite possible. There's lots of time to figure that out. Yeah. So then, let's just talk about 51 Division and working as a cop. Um, so for anyone outside of like Toronto or Canada, can you just briefly explain what that exactly is, then how? your like time working as a cop influenced your writing because you do write like murder mystery yeah um let's see how to best describe 51 division let's see the officers usually refer to it as either the armpit of the city the toilet of the city or basically a shithole it's a great place to learn how to be a cop uh it's incredibly busy back when i started it was like the you know the highest crime rate in the city and unfortunately now there are other places in the city that are matching it if not surpassing it a lot of street crime you know prostitution drug dealing crack like you wouldn't believe robberies so i i think within the first six months i was probably first on scene at you know maybe two homicides also made you know arrests from everything from like i said you know simple possession of crack right up to you know aggravated assault and stuff so it's very busy area a lot of diversity money-wise. You have homeless people. Um, at one time, the division held something like 83% of the men's hostel beds in the city. But then at the north end of the city, you have Rosedale, one of the you know the more wealthy parts of the city. Mm-hmm. So the economic um, divide there was it was just you know huge. So you had to deal with all types of, of people. 
And then, so as your time as a cop, did that make you want to write a story based on what you've seen? Or was you just like, this is the kind of stories I like to read? I don't read police stories. Okay. Um, I read fantasy primarily, mm-hmm. waiting desperately for George Martin to put out the, <laughs> I feel the like next everyone book in is... the, the Game of Thrones. I actually wrote a fantasy novel. And thank God there's not a, a copy of that left in existence. <laughs> but um, I, I started, it was funny, um, where I lived, there was a... Just off of Young Street, there was a, an empty pit where they had started digging for a, a building and just left it. And I used to walk my dog past there. And, and one day I just thought about, you know, because every time I'd glance in and, you know, I thought to myself, well, one of these days I wonder if I'll see a dead body. And that just got me thinking about, okay, all right, here's some of the weird. If I was going to kill somebody, where would I dump the body? And stories just started developing from there, and it seemed an a natural step to take the policing experience and into the writing. Mm-hmm. And the practical side of me said also, you know, it'd probably be easier to publish a, a police novel as a cop because yeah. it would have that little, you know, hook mm-hmm. to it. So, um, they do seem yeah. to write what you know. Yeah, that's it. I mean, the stories are placed in 51 Division. Mm-hmm. I use actual street locations. In fact, uh, the Toronto Police, when I submitted that I was going to be publishing this book, they came back and said, no. Really? You cannot. And I'm like, well, why not? And they said, you, you just can't. I offered them a copy. Like, I can send you an e-copy and you yeah. can read it. So they made all of these decisions actually without ever reading the book. But they said I couldn't because I would tarnish the image of the Toronto Police, which I think they were doing fine on their own. I would insult the residents of 51 Division two other reasons those aren't good <laughs> yeah um oh they said it was a conflict of interest which they never explained i guess they thought i'd go to calls and think oh this would make a good storyline yeah. instead of doing my job i would take notes for a story i don't know and they also said it was against the police service act which it wasn't because i checked and the only time an officer can't write a book or a story is if it basically touches on a previous or an ongoing investigation mm-hmm. so you just basically can't mess anything up yeah minor fiction they take place in an actual place but you know they're fictional stories um and they say yeah no you cannot you cannot you cannot you cannot publish it you cannot promote it you can't even write anymore what yeah luckily for me they kind of caught me at a time in my life when i was not overly happy with the toronto police so Mm -hmm. i basically said no screw you i'm publishing it and uh, the media got hold of it. Uh, Joe Warmington, especially at The Sun, wrote a nice huge article on me and how they were trying to censor me, and they backed right off. Yeah. So, Did you have people had comments being like, this is what I wanted to see, like a real true story of like experiences? Because sometimes I'm sure a mystery story is not actually accurate in like a cop perspective. Yeah, that's one reason why I don't read a lot of yeah. police novels is because... You know, you catch one little error and you're like, ah, oh, and that just kind of pulls you out of the story. Yeah. The the publisher actually said he he liked the books because it gave him an, uh, a view of Toronto that he didn't know existed. Mm-hmm. Which is um, important, I think. Yes, because, I mean, the stories are written. Jack Warren, the, the main character, he's, he's a uniform cop. He's not, you know, the homicide cop. He's not the forensics officer who finds clues, you know, on the underbelly of a toad hiding under a... F- <laughs> under a rock or something. A CSI yeah. yeah, yeah, he's a uniform grunt, basically. Yeah. And the stories are told primarily from his point of view. I've had quite a few police officers, not just in Toronto, but from other forces, have mm-hmm. gotten in touch with me, and they said, yeah, we love it that there's a cop out there writing these stories. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, the main stories are fiction, but there's little anecdotes, there's little side things that I've pulled from real life. Yeah. You know, the, the guy with the cockroaches living in his toes? Yes, I saw that. You know, what a visual. <laughs> yeah. So things like that. So I tried to make it and I ex- tried explaining this to the, the Toronto police that, you know, I'm pulling people into our world to let them know that we're not just out there writing tickets and eating donuts. Yeah. That at times this job really does suck. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's exciting. Sometimes it's funny. You know, I just wanted to show them what it's like to, you know, to do the job. Yeah. So, uh, some of my biggest fans, uh, other than my mother-in-law, um, <laughs> Are police officers. One of the biggest compliments I ever got was a female officer up in 32 saw me one day and she's just finished the book. I said, Oh, that's good. And she went, Oh, Karen's a bitch. <laughs> and I'm like, Cool, thank you. You know, to 
get an emotional yeah. response from a fictional character. I mean, that's awesome. Thank you. Did you find it hard to balance, like, what would you take from real life and what would be fiction? Or were you just like, there's not a line I'm going to cross, I'm not going to do there, it? There, there were things I knew I wasn't going Like, I wasn't going to reveal, you know, obviously training issues. Like, I wasn't going to put in print how to clear a jam in your gun. Like, I could, to make it interesting, have a gun jam on him in a, in a, in a gunfight. But I'm like, no, I'm not going to put that in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, yeah, training things I didn't put in. But... I also went in, I didn't want to be politically correct. Mm -hmm. In fact, in the first book, one character, Sai, says to his partner, he says, if you came, if you're looking for political correctness, you came to the wrong place. And so I tried to paint a very real image of what it's like just to work in a scout car. Mm -hmm. So just to talk about the crisis intervention team, is that Mm -hmm. right, that you were talking about earlier? Do you include mental illness? Because you were talking about you like to, like a not politically correct, that's what you like to include in your story. Do you like to talk about mental illness? Because I think you said it's a big part of what you enjoy doing. Like I said, yeah, it was a, it was a huge part of the job, my, my favorite time. And yes, I, in the books, like I said, there, there's a time when Jack is actually on the, the crisis team. Mm-hmm. So I do touch on uh, the mental illness a bit. And you could say... You know, there are characters throughout the story who are suffering from various forms of mental illness. Um, you could argue that Jack himself, mm-hmm. you know, might be. So, yeah, it's in there. I don't, like, want to try and preach, but it's just, yeah, it's it's part of the stories. Yeah. So what initially drew you to self-publishing? Well, I originally was published with a Toronto publishing uh, group here, and they contracted me for three books. So I wrote the first three. And I had always had it in my mind that it was going to be six books long. So after the first three, I was like, I finished the fourth one and I sent it to them. And silly me thought, no, this is a slam dunk. They'll want to finish off the series. No, they didn't. They really didn't give me a reason as to why they didn't want to uh, pick me up again. And so I shopped around to other publishers and learned a very important lesson. And that is no publisher wants to pick up a series halfway through Mm -hmm. because then they're involved with the other publisher. So I was like, oh, crap. One publishing company said, well, just kind of like restart it, change the names. And and I I really didn't want to do that. Um, So I thought, you know what? I'll finish the series. I think all of your readers are very grateful that you did not leave the series halfway through. Well, thank you. Yeah. (laughs) And I know that would, as I said with, you know, George Martin, it's like, hurry up and finish the damn book, you know. So, yeah, I wanted to finish it off. And I thought, you know what? This will give me experience. Mm -hmm. And... You know, and that's how I end up meeting uh, Carmen to do the covers, which are fabulous. I love the covers that you do, and yes, you'll be hitting you up for the sixth one. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's basically it. Was it, I really wasn't drawn to self publishing? It was kind of forced upon me, and mm-hmm. I don't mind because the last book, the fifth one, I didn't even use an editor, which I had on the fourth one. I just got in contact with the one that had freelanced for uh, the publisher. Um, but that time I thought, you know what, I'm going to try it myself. And I, I think I did a pretty good job. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's enjoyable. The editing process is long and tedious. But, oh, yeah. you know, I can now say I've done it. So, And you have a lot more control over your own work. Yeah. Now, that, that was one thing that was nice because I'd heard a story once about another Toronto officer. Now, this would have been back maybe in the 90s who wrote a book. And somebody said that, you know, he, he was, you know, uh, complaining that... By the time the book was actually published, he barely recognized it from what he had submitted. And I thought, oh, crap, I hope that doesn't happen. But I didn't find that. They they were pretty good with with me. The the editor and I, you know, had a different opinion in in a few times. I also learned once uh, with the second book, they wanted me to change the ending, which I did. And I've been kicking myself ever since. Oh, no. So the self-editing is is good, but it always, always helps to have someone else look at your work. Mm Mm-hmm. Did you know anything about self-publishing, or were you just thrown into it? Oh, I... No, didn't know a damn thing. (laughs) How did you uh, try to navigate it? basically went onto the Amazon website, and they're Mm. like, you know, self-publish. I'm like, okay, click here, I'll see what (laughs) happens. And, I mean, yeah, it's fairly straightforward. You basically Mm -hmm. just give it to them and say, here, you know, put this out there. Yeah. The problem was, and I got complaints back, people were like, you know, the the formatting was all over the place and, and that, and I tried fixing it, and through the computer across the room and um, I think that's when I got an email from yeah that, that's yeah. when Carmen got an email saying can you do this for me please 
Uh, and now I know I don't even have to worry about that because Carmen can do all that. Do you approach any other aspect of self-publishing yourself, like marketing-wise? Oh, God. No. <laughs> um, I should. But I have understood from talking to other writers and reading about it, this is typical. We just like to write. 100%. You know, yep. and no, I, should I be on Facebook? Yeah. Should I be on Twitter and doing all of that stuff? Yes, I should. Do I? No. I mean, do what you like to do. And if it's not Twitter, you find something else. Yeah. And honestly, once I finish this sixth book, it'll, you know, the series will be complete. And I'm hoping that anyone that picked up any of the first ones will see it through to the end. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. You know, maybe when I, I start another series, or though it'd really be nice to maybe get a hook up with a publisher that time. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, are there any mistakes that you've made or advice you wish you'd heard when you first started self-publishing? Uh, uh, mistakes? Um, probably. That was my biggest fear doing the self-editing because I had the story in my head, so it all made sense to me. Mm -hmm. And I was really hoping that it made sense to someone else. Um so the one thing I learned is, yeah, you've got to get somebody else to read it just in case there's something in there that is painfully obvious to me, but someone else is like, huh, what? That's a really good point because you've spent months making yeah, these Yeah, you're so familiar mm -hmm. with the story. And, I mean, in the editing process, I, I I think I went through the book four times. And by then your brain is just mush and you're, the last thing you want to do is read it again. So, yeah, definitely get a fresh pair of eyes on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if, if you can self-promote and you know how, great, do it. I don't know how. and We're here to help. <laughs> yeah, that's that's great. And like I say, uh, eventually I'll, I'll step into the 21st century. But um, Just slowly, casually get in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're busy in Costa Rica. Yeah, yeah, that's the excuse. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any resources that you would use before? Are there just guidelines? I guess I've been lucky because I write what I know, mm -hmm. so I really haven't had to, to reference a lot. I've been the police source for a couple other uh, authors um, that knew me, and they would occasionally ask me questions or give me a scene and say, you know, read this, does it make sense mm -hmm. procedural-wise? Uh, because they want to avoid those little mistakes and assumptions. So for the police novels, like, I mean... The one coming up, uh, a friend of mine, former partner, uh, works in our forensic unit. So whenever I have a question about fingerprints or, or anything like that, I can reach out to him and, and say, does this make sense? Although I think I worried him when I asked, how long do fingerprints survive if you <laughs> if you protect them? And he's like, what are you doing? I said, nothing, nothing. <laughs> just, just curious. Yeah. Do you feel like if any author had a question, they could like contact some like a police officer or someone in their area to get information, or do you feel like they might have to do a sneakier way? It d would depend on the question mm -hmm. and if you knew this officer. But honestly, if there's any um, writers out there that have, you know, shall we say a, a generic police question, mm -hmm. drop me an email. I can, you know, I can answer it. And if I can't find out the answer, chances are I m should be able to get. Like I said, you know, if you've got a forensic question, I can ask my buddy yeah. and uh, see. Um, but, like, I don't mind doing that because, like I said, there's nothing worse than reading through a book and, you know, having... Knowing that's wrong. Knowing that's wrong, that's wrong, and it's, yeah. Do you know any authors that, like, get it right and you're like, that's good mystery police? You know, that, like I said, this thing, I don't read, yeah. I don't read police novels. Um, I, I guess it's because, you know, no, I did that for a living. Just, like, I really don't... I don't watch police shows, mm -hmm. you know. The only type of policing thing I watch, you know, maybe like lethal weapon movies because they're so <laughs> far from reality anyways. Yeah. Those are my grandmother's favorite movies. <laughs> Absolute favorite. Yeah. Um, you think you might ever write a fantasy novel? Actually, I, ha I have an idea for a couple of fantasy uh, stories, but what I really want to work on next uh, after the, the Rage novels is an urban fantasy. And part of it is because I, I see so much urban fantasy out there. A lot of them are thinly disguised romance novels, which is fine. But they're all, not to insult anyone who enjoys these books, they're on the Harry Potter side. Like, wave a magic wand, say a proper word, and you can 
turn a lizard into a Tyrannosaurus Rex. No. Or the heroine is dating the local vampire who owns a nightclub while having a turf war with uh, a werewolf. This all makes sense, yes. Yeah. The urban fantasy I have in mind is going to be a lot darker. The uh, the magical world will be uh, a hidden world underneath. So if you compare a lot of the urban fantasy and say, oh, it's kind of like a Harry Potter, I'm aiming more of a, for like a, a Game of Thrones type of thing, mm-hmm. a more adult version. And yeah, so that's, that's what I'm, my mind is rolling over the most right now. I'm just curious, have you been writing your whole life or was it something you just decided to do one day? No, uh, my mom, very artistic, uh, a painter. Oils, pastels, watercolors, everything. My dad is a, an engineer, a mechanical engineer, and I think I'm kind of a, a good mix of the two. And I tried writing, I tried, no, not sorry, I tried painting, drawing, I tried music, but the writing was something that finally clicked like in high school. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it seems that the practical side, the engineering side of me can put the thoughts down in words and the artistic side for my mom kind of can make them enjoyable to read. Mm-hmm. So no, I haven't been doing it all my life, but started playing with it say like in grade 13 and then a bit through high school that's where that fantasy novel came from and um yeah started you know seriously um after getting on the police Mm -hmm. and realizing yeah this is you know i could start using this for stories so you're writing while you were working yes how did you manage that the the shift work was actually very good for it you Mm -hmm. do like i think they're still using the compressed work week but you work seven days in a row uh but you anywhere from three, five, or six days off afterwards. So I could devote those days off to writing. So that, that was the easiest way. Mm-hmm. It's not like I would sit at work and do it. I've yeah. got I've got I to be at home where it's quiet with my music. And, you do you know, have a routine? You're like, this is how I do? I could say the routine used to be, well, music is always a part of it. It's kind of like a white noise just to, mm-hmm. to block things out. Um, uh, it used to be at the dining room table with a, a large mug of tea, um, a dog on my feet, mm-hmm. and you know, just working on the laptop. There's no dog now. Still frequently a large cup of tea or a, like a, a, a cider. There's usually a cigar involved now as well, but the music like is that. still there. We haven't had a cigar yet. <laughs> yeah, it's just I, that, that's something I picked up in Costa Rica. Uh-huh. And um, you know, I'm, I'm quite sure I could write without a cigar, yeah. um, but uh, I, it's nice writing with one. Yeah, so I, I think the main thing is I need that music, and that's just to block out everything else. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't sit in a coffee shop and write. Yeah. You know, that would drive me nuts. Um, yeah, so I, I, I need quiet. I think we're both those that put headphones yeah. on and just Don't get talk to me. To <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that's what the music is for. It just yeah. kind of blocks out all the noise. Do you have any tips or tricks for an author who's struggling to finish their first draft or just tr- struggling writing at the moment? Do you anything that helps you? Two things. One is write. Mm-hmm. You have to write. The more you do it, the easier it is. I equate it like going to the gym. If you go to the gym once a week, you're, you're not going to get the results. Mm-hmm. If you go pretty much every day, it gets easier. So when I was, um, like I said, when I was writing in Costa Rica and I was writing pretty much every day, Simply the act of opening up the laptop and sitting down was almost enough to, to get me into it. Mm-hmm. And day after day, it's just easier and easier and easier. So the first thing is you, you have to write. Whether you're actually working on your story or maybe do some short stories on the side. And the other thing is read. Read authors that you like, mm-hmm. whose style uh, that you enjoy. And I find myself doing that a lot. I'll I'll read and I'll go, wow, I really like how he or she wrote that. And I'll go back and reread it. Also, read bad books. Yeah. I don't know who said this, uh, but I heard uh, a director once say, you can learn more about making a good movie by watching a bad movie. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, there'll be times I'll read a book and I'll go, oh, wow, I don't like this. Why? Why don't I like it? Mm -hmm. Because for me, style is more important than the actual story. I'd rather read a bad story well written than a good story poorly written. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, it's it's the style that's important. And you may not have to finish those bad books, but 
read the first 10 pages and figure out, okay, why why hasn't this author pulled me in yet? Mm-hmm. Um, so those are the two main things I would suggest. Someone I was reading the other day, they write romance books, and then if she's struggling, she'll write a really bad romantic scene for herself. And like that will help prompt her. She's like, nothing will be as bad as that. <laughs> yep. yep. Anything will improve. Yeah. yeah. Everyone's going to have their little uh, tricks. Like, I mean, usually when I sit down, get the computer going up, yeah, the first half hour is probably playing free cell. And for you me, that's, to. it's almost like a meditation thing. Just mm-hmm. get everything out of the head. Let, you know, it used to be when I had a dog, it would be I'd take the dog for the morning walk and think, what am I going to write about today mm-hmm. you know, as I was walking the dogs? Um, so, yeah, uh, every, everyone's going to have something different. Do you track your word count? I know that a lot of authors will sometimes do that. You're just a free. No, you know, I'll, I'll see the page count go up. And I have never aimed thinking, okay, this book is going to be this number of pages. It They've just all turned out to kind of rant and hit around the 300 mark. Lucky. Yeah, it's just, that's the way it's <laughs> happened. Um, I imagine the sixth book will probably be about the same. And if for your readers uh, listening, when can they expect the sixth book or... Are you working on something else? We don't know. No, I am working on the sixth one. I <sighs> put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. It, like I mean, you know, I, I don't want to think. You know, it'd be it'd be nice to think that there are thousands and thousands of people out there desperately waiting for the sixth book. There might be hundreds. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, I would. My partner Mary has said, you know, well, why don't you write something else if this just isn't going i said i i know i've got to finish this story because if i don't finish it now if i get started on something else it's gonna be a george R. Yeah. R. R. martin situation yeah <laughs> and so when people are waiting for the book and you go into the bookstore like i did the other week and you see martin's name i'm like finally no this is a prequel <laughs> i didn't want a prequel i want the next book so yes i'm working on the sixth book in the rage series sixth and final when check out this space <laughs> yeah um and I'm horrible. I don't update my website or anything like that. Basically, it's like, yeah, when keep going checking Kobo, you know, it's just like, <laughs> is how many books does he have out? Oh, good. Now there's a sixth one. Yeah. Will it be later this year? Maybe um, early next year. I, it all depends on on life, mm-hmm. and life can be a bitch sometimes. So. And then, so just. A little fun question. What have you been loving lately? It can be a book, a movie, TV show, something that you think other people should check out. I'm always looking for that next great series uh, in the books. There's nothing better than finding a new author and realizing, wow, this guy or girl, she's got like 30 books. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I haven't found recently that. Uh, Right now, I'm actually rereading Stephen King's Under the Dome. Mm -hmm. I find Stephen King is the style I like the most, so... I actually find reading one of his books can help me write. Mm -hmm. It kind of encourages me. Yeah, and movie-wise, yeah, just just waiting for the next Avengers film. Oh, yeah, that's soon. Soon. (laughs) Who knows when this will be out? (laughs) Maybe it's out. No, April, April. All right, it will be right around this time. We're very relevant right now. Thank you so much for being a guest today. Thank thank you, and like I said, if, if anyone does have police questions or anything like that, Brent Pilkey, author at gmail.com. We'll have his email listed on the blog post about Perfect. this episode. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. So we hope you enjoyed our episode with Brent. Thank you very much for listening. Don't forget to check out our blog where we'll have a write-up on today's episode. And if you enjoy this episode or any of our previous episodes, please leave a review. We'd really appreciate it. And thank you so much for listening. And until next time, have a nice day. Thank you for listening to the Kobo Writing Life podcast, where we provide insights and stories from leaders and experimenters in the world of self-publishing. If you want even more information about growing your Kobo sales, check out our blog or find us on social. And if you're just finding us and ready to start your self-publishing journey today, sign up for free at kobo.com slash writing life. Until next time, happy writing!